morning. Uh, what a privilege it is to be here with you this morning. My name's Greg, if you don't know who I am. And uh, with Dave gone, he's given me the opportunity to come and share with you this morning. Uh, why in the world are things going in the wrong direction? Well, the, the simple answer to it, it's a lot deeper than this, but the simple answer to it is the world's going away from Jesus. And he talked about sin in that little video, and of course that's, that's a key to the whole thing. Um, let me start this morning so you know what kind of direction I'm headed. I'm going to start with some lyrics from a song from Big Daddy Weave. If you've heard of him before. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. And if I told you my story, you would hear love that never gave up. And if I told you my story, you would hear life, but it wasn't mine. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of him. Well, what I'm going to do this morning is to share my story with you, at least part of my story. I've been around here at Catalyst for a year and a half, maybe two, somewhere in that area. And you may know who I am by looking at my face, and maybe we've talked a little bit, but most of you probably don't know my story. And I think it's important for you to know a little bit more about me. But even beyond that, what's most important is that my story, I pray that it points you towards God. So let me open up here before I start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning and share this, what you've put on my heart. And I just pray, Lord, as I present it, that it, be, it comes out clear and understandable. And Lord, I pray it brings you glory. I sure do love you. Amen. Well, I grew up in Evansville, just about a few miles west, maybe five, six, seven miles west of here, on a hilltop. It's where my house is at. I went to Wright's High School on a hill. I went from Wrights to Western Kentucky University on a hill. Now, I can't tell you what that means. All I can tell you is that there's something about a hill going on in my life, and I'm waiting for God to show me what that is, but I thought it was at least important to mention that. There's another unique thing I think is pretty neat going on, is that where this church sits used to be called Bucyrus Erie, and for nearly 40 years, this is where my dad worked. All that time I was growing up, my dad was right here on this property, and I think it's just kind of interesting that here I am today where he was so many years. Growing up, I went to church pretty much every Sunday, and we talked about Jesus. We were even taught that he died on the cross. But that cross was never connected to salvation. What was actually being taught was being a good person, that you had to earn your way to heaven. In other words, Jesus dying for us wasn't enough. And I was not a believer at the time. Maybe that's why I like sports so much, because I always have a scoreboard in my head, and I'm keeping track of what, what have I done good, what have I done bad, am I winning, am I losing, I'm not sure. That was confusion, and that's not the way God works, and that is not the way to salvation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. In eighth grade, still at that church, I attended a confirmation class, which is what, just what you did. And in that class... I don't remember much about it, but in that class, I was given a life verse. And I'm going to put that life verse on the screen, and that's where I want to start today. Romans 8, 28. I have 29 up there. I'll explain that in a second, but it was actually only Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's the verse that God gave to me back then. As I start to tell more of my story, that's kind of where it starts, uh, I, I will do it in four sections. i got four points. And the first one is this. God gives us choice. God gives us choice. Just like the video talked about, it, it all started with Adam and Eve. God gave them a choice. Are you going to follow me or not? I've got some directions for you, and this is what I want you to do, but you get to choose. And, of course, they chose to disobey, and that's when sin entered the world. Now, I don't want you to miss that point, point. and before I go on, I want, to, I want to really talk to you. There may be some of you out here today, some of you online watching, that do not have a relationship with Jesus, and this is too important to pass up. So just for a second, I'm going to play the role of God. I have to, I have to take my glasses off because he doesn't need glasses. He's got 20-20 vision, right? Uh, so here's what I think God would say to you this morning. If you do not know Jesus... He's saying, I know everything about you, everything about you. Everyone that has ever walked the earth, aside from Jesus, everyone has sinned. Because 
It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And here's the problem. The problem is that in heaven with me, sin cannot enter. Sin cannot dwell in heaven. And you have a sin problem. Therefore, you, you, there's, a, there's a gap there. You can't come to heaven in the condition that you are currently in. But I've got a great deal for you. And let me share you what that deal is. Now, don't shut me out. Listen to me, because this is the best deal you're ever going to get. Okay? You can either do this. You can keep what you have. Kind of like, let's make a deal. You can keep what you have right now. You can keep the sin. You can keep the condemnation. And you can even spend eternity without me. That's your choice. It's your choice. Or, you can take this gift that I've got for you. This gift is my son. You can take him, and here's, here's how, how it works. You can exchange your sin. He'll take it. He already died on the cross for you. He'll take that guilt. He'll take that shame. He'll take that sin away from you, and he'll give back to you. In exchange, he'll give you eternal life. That is a great deal. But you have a choice. You know, the interesting part about that, go back to me for a second. The interesting part about that, Scripture tells us most people will reject the gift. Most people are going to reject And that seems crazy to me. But they will. They don't understand. They don't understand how much God loves them to sacrifice his own son. How much Jesus loved them to go through all that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's a choice. God doesn't condemn anybody to hell. They choose to go there. That seems crazy, but that's the way it works. So let me go back to Romans 8, 28, and 29. All things work together for... The good, the holes who love God and are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Get this. For those who love God, all things work together. Which means those who don't love God, all things don't work together. And what that's saying is you can't love God and reject Jesus at the same time. So if you don't choose to accept Jesus as your Savior, you're saying, God, I don't love you. You just are. All things are not going to work together. Now, that doesn't mean, and we'll get into this, that does not mean that uh, life is going to be bad. You're going to have good times and bad times, just like believers do. There are good things we go through and rough things we go through. That's part of this life. But what that means in the end, beyond this, because there is something better coming. When Jesus comes back, there's something better. When that happens... All things are not going to work together for, for good for those who rejected Jesus because there's only one, two destinations that we're going to end up, one of two. We're either going to be with God forever in heaven by accepting Jesus, the gift of eternal life, or we're going to be separated from God forever in hell. Jesus talked about that. That's a real place, folks. That's the choice. Seems crazy that you would reject Jesus, but some will do that. I just implore you, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior at this point, now's the time to do that. I ask you to consider it, but there, the thing that you don't have, if you don't make a decision today, you don't have to. But here's, the, here's another catch. One day, you won't be able to make a decision. See, God knows everything. He knows when Jesus is coming back. He knows when the time is going to run out, but we as human beings do not. We don't know that we're going to have breath tomorrow. So the choice is really, you, you can play the odds if you want to, but it's a dangerous choice because it has eternal consequence. So I ask you to consider Jesus. Please consider Jesus. Okay, let's look at verse 29 again. For those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. See, bad things are still going to happen. Even if you accept Jesus, that doesn't mean life is smooth. And you all know that. Those of you that know Jesus know that's not true. I mean, that, that is true. Life is difficult. We have difficulties. But verse 29, there's still sin in the world, but verse 29 answers the question, why? At least one answer to the question, why? For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. Folks, that's what God is doing. 
when the manure that we've been talking about here at Catalyst for a couple months now, when the manure comes into your life and the difficult circumstances come, it's our perspective that matters. Because whom, good things are going to happen later, but maybe not right away. But we're going to be, what God is doing with that stuff is he's conforming us into the image of Jesus. That's what he wants. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 3. Looking, to, it's not on the screen. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured, there's that word again, from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Folks, Jesus endured pain and suffering. He endured the cross. But what it says was, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Why? Because he knew what was coming on the other side. I've got, I'm going to go through this pain, but there's joy coming on the other side. Here's what it says in Romans 8:18. 8, I consider, this Paul, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So he's saying, yes, you're going to have pain. If you're going to be like Jesus, you can, experience, you can expect you're going to experience pain and suffering. That's part of it. But God is conforming us into the image of Jesus. He's, if Jesus is going to go through it and we want to be a follower, we're going to go through it as well. But on the other side of that, that's where all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. There's something better coming on the other side of the pain. Now, sometimes the pain we experience is temporal. I mean, it's short. And honestly, in, in terms of eternity, our life is short. It just doesn't feel that way. But sometimes we go through pain and the answer or it gets resolved fairly quickly. Other times, it doesn't work that way. And other times, like, like I'll share with you in my story, there's pain in my life that is still there because God has not revealed to me what's on the other side of it. And I'll get to that in just a second. But I think it's important to know our perspective. When you hit the manure, when life stinks and you don't like it, remember what God wants to do. He wants to make you more like Jesus. And when you think about that, it seems silly that we'd want to resist that. But we fight. We fight. We don't want it. We don't want it. But God said, look what it's doing. Look what I'm doing. Does that make sense? So when, when the manure comes, you've got a choice. You can get bitter about it, or you can get better by turning to Jesus. Point, let's go to point two. Change is part of life. Maybe you've seen or heard this quote before. God loves you just the way you are but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Have you ever heard that before? See, change interferes with our independence. We want to be in control of what's going on in our life. It can bring uncertainty into our life. We, we want to know what's coming next. Can you relate to that these days? What's coming next? We don't know what's coming. Even though I may not like where I'm at right now, I'm comfortable in my yuck. So I don't really want it to change because I don't know what that's going to do. It may be better, but I, at least I know what this is. So I was, I'll just stay here. Change also sometimes can feel like a punishment. And I can assure you when we go through the manure in our life, God is not doing it to punish us. We have to remember that. God is doing that to change us, to conform us in the image of Jesus. Okay, let's look at this for a second. Discipline. We talk about discipline, and I'll get to the scripture in that in just a second. We often associate discipline with something negative. It's a bad thing. When you get disciplined, you've been a bad person. Well, God is not there with a sledgehammer to hit you over the head. Okay, that's not what he's doing. The root of discipline means disciple. And to disciple means to teach. So as we're going through the stuff that we go through that God is walking us through, he wants to teach us something. Don't resist it. It's, it's, that's part of the human nature. We want to resist that. But God is trying to teach you something. Let's look at this next passage here. It's in Ephesians chapter, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12. Here we go. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. There's that word again, endure. Remember Jesus endured the cross? God is treating you as sons. God is treating you like Jesus. Why do we resist that? That's the best thing that could happen. For what son is there that whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, 
then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good. There's that again. It comes out of Romans. That we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields that peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Can you see how all that fits together? When we're disciplined, God is teaching us and he's training us. And he says, yes, it might seem painful at the time, but just wait. I got something better coming. I got something better coming. Trust me. So it's not punishment from God. He's conforming us. He's teaching us. He wants us to be more like Jesus. So from here, I'm going to start and really get into my story. And uh, my story has been full of change. And I think you'll see that as we go through it. Uh, and again, I pray that this story, that God will use it for you to, yes, get to know me better, but I want you to look at how God is working. I, I, it's taken me a while. And some of the things I didn't see right away. But now some of the things he's been revealing to me, stuff that happened years ago, and I'm like, oh, that's what that was. And I'm sure there's more that I haven't seen yet, but it really helps your perspective. First thing I want to say is, since 1987, 33 years ago, I've moved, physically moved residences 30, uh, excuse me, 33, 19 times. That's enough. 19 is plenty. If you've ever moved even once, you know that's not a fun process. But I've moved Texas, Kentucky, Indiana, Germany, all over the place. We'll get into that. Moving is not fun, but it's change. And I can see, looking back, how God has been using that in my life. It was in 1987 that I was first introduced to Jesus as my Savior when I understood what the cross actually meant. It was also the first year that I got married. Right after we got married, uh, we moved to Texas. And have you ever heard the slogan, Texas is like a whole other country? Yes, it is. It is. Um, there was a lot of manure while we were down in Texas. I worked at Sam Houston State University. I was in the housing department. Uh, we had staff functions. Spouses were not invited to come. First year of marriage, and I said, sorry, i got to go to a function. We're going to have fun, but you have to stay home. That was not very fun. I didn't have a choice, but that wasn't fun. We were told, get your Yankee butts back north. We don't want you down here. We had all kinds of things that happened down there that made our experience not so great. Now, God did provide a couple of things that were pretty cool. We bought a horse while we were there, and we were able to go out, and, and we were actually practicing to be in a rodeo, believe that. Uh, but it was a nice escape from what we were doing in, in the work sector, section. But uh, never, that never happened. Can you picture me on a horse? Yeah, yeah. Can you? Yeah, that's good. He was a big sucker, too. We named him Conan because he, he was a brute. Um, I hated selling that horse. But it was also good. It actually was good to get out of Texas. Um, that doesn't mean everybody in Texas. I'm not mean, meaning to bad mouth. My experience wasn't great. It was about 10 months into that where Western Kentucky University, where I worked and went to school before that, called me and said, hey, we would like for you to come back and join our housing staff in Bowling Green. And we were ecstatic to be able to go back closer to home. Now, for me, I lived in Bowling Green for a while, so that kind of was home. But we were at least closer to Evansville because we're both from Evansville. And uh, we moved back there, but had no idea that the manure that was waiting for us there wasn't so much the work. It was a familiar thing. But in the, in the short period of time that we were there, uh, my wife experienced two miscarriages. If you've ever been part of that or known someone that has had a miscarriage, that is a painful, painful experience. It's a joyous thing when you find out you're going to have life, and then it just gets ripped away. At least that's what it feels like. Um, it was pain. In 1990, um, I got offered a job at USI, and they offered me to come and be the director of housing there. Now, let me tell you something about 1990 at USI. They didn't have a housing department. They had a bunch of apartments, which they still do. They had a bunch of apartments out there. They were all had USI students in them, but they were not under the jurisdiction of the university. So they asked me to come in and turn this into a housing department and, and make something out of the chaos. Actually, it was kind of like Animal House out there. I mean, they'd look at me and go, well, you can't do anything to me. We're not part of the university. They knew that. 
That was a lot of manure, folks. That was a hard, hard time. That was a hard time. I was there for eight years. Now, <laughs> 1990 was also the year my first son was born. So that was, that was another change. That was not manure. I'm not saying that. It certainly wasn't. But it was challenging. And having not been a parent before, I really didn't know what to expect. So I'm experiencing all this manure with my work. And actually, they had me and our family living in the apartments. So when I went home, I still couldn't go home. I was still right there in the middle of all of it. That was a hard period of time. Uh, but what I didn't know was what was coming later, which was even more difficult. Four years later, my second son was born. That was not the difficulty. Uh, we thought we were kind of getting the hang of things. Um, but then two years after that, when, he, when my youngest son turned two years old, we were actually building a home, and we were going to get distance from campus a little bit. We were excited about that. But while we were in the process of building the home, one day my two-year-old son, who was, he was walking at that time, just <laughs> fell over. Couldn't use his legs anymore. We couldn't even sit him up without propping him with pillows. He just would fall right back over. His eyes were just darting back and forth. We had no idea. It just came out of the blue to us. I had no idea what that was. So, of course, we took him to the doctor, and the doctor said, get this kid to the hospital. We went right into the hospital that day, and they ran all kinds of tests, spinal taps, all kinds of stuff, trying to figure out what was wrong. And they couldn't find out what was wrong. So they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. He needs to go to Riley Hospital, and this is critical. So we're going to put him in a helicopter, and we're going to life flight him all the way up to, to Riley. Well, but what that meant was he's going to go on the helicopter. Mom and Dad, you can't go. You're going to have to drive up there and meet him there. That is not really what we wanted. We didn't want him to be alone like that. But it wasn't too much later that they came back and said, well, plans have changed. We can't, we can't use the helicopter because... Storms and rain up in Indianapolis, you're never going to be able to get the helicopter in to land it. We're going to have to put him up, take him up there by ambulance. So instead of him riding by himself on a helicopter and us following and meeting him later, I rode in the back of an ambulance on a gurney with him laying on my chest the entire way up there. It took about, whatever, three hours or whatever. And I didn't see it at the time, but when I look back at that now, that's a picture of God. You know, when we're alone, when we're sick, when we don't know what's going on, God's right there. He's got his arms around us the whole time. That's what a loving father does. That's what God does for us, even when we can't see it. And God was showing me a picture of what, how much he loves me, how much he loves my son by, by that example. I didn't see that right then. It took me a while. Now, while he was up there, he was up there for a full week, couldn't figure out what was, still couldn't figure out what was wrong. All kinds of doctors looking at him. And finally, one of the interns told us there is a retired physician. He's here in town, here in Indianapolis, giving a lecture. I don't know what it was about, but he had a background in infectious diseases, and they were trying to figure out what kind of disease does this child have. So he went over there and was bold enough to ask this doctor if he would come over and take a look at my son, and he did. And that doctor came over, and I don't know, he seemed like he was 80 at the time. I don't, I don't know. He's just an older guy. He's retired. He came in, and after about five minutes, he said, Get this child out of this hospital. He's got encephalitis of the brainstem, and everything you're doing in here is stimulating that brainstem. If you don't get him out of here, he's going to die. Take him home and get him out of all this stimulation. Well, the doctors told us as we were checking him out, they said, you can expect that he's probably never going to walk, and you can expect he's probably going to be a vegetable his whole life. Just, I'm just telling you that up front. Well, let me fast forward 16 years later. To that same child who got a college football scholarship. And he was academic, all conference, all four years. Folks, that's God. There's no way I could have seen that through all the suffering. And look what God brought out of that. What a testimony of how much God loves us. It's incredible. But it wasn't over there. It kept The manure kept coming. Now, he got better, and that was great. But it was about 10 months later or so, we were finally moved into our house, just barely, and I was out, I can remember this is just like it was yesterday, out seeding our, our yard, trying to get a yard, going some grass, and I got a phone call. I was on vacation, and my boss at USI, it was him, and he said, hey, when you get back in on Monday morning, I want to have a meeting with you. I want you to come into my office. I said, okay. And I went into his office on that, in that morning. It was my, my oldest son's birthday, July 7th. 
And he, here's what he said. Here's what I remember. You're not the person we want to run this department anymore. We're going to run a national search and replace you. All I heard was you're fired. That's all I heard. He didn't use those words, but that's in, in essence what he told me. But as I processed that, I realized he can't get rid of me right now. If he's going to do a national search, we're opening up the university in August where all the students are going to come in. He needs me right now. But I also knew I was a lame duck. That at some point, he's going to, he's going to replace me and, sh and ship me right out. So I'm going, all right, I got a son that just, we think he's over this illness. We don't know. Got a new house, and now I'm going to have no money coming in at some point. There was a lot of anxiety, I can assure you. Well, fast forward six days later, we went to church. Did every week. The church we went to, there were three services. Here we've got two. There they had three. We always, for whatever reason, we always went to the middle service, the second service, which is what we did that Sunday. And there was a missionary from Black Forest Academy in Germany. He was in town. I guess he's on furlough for the, for the year or for the summer. And he had five minutes to speak in the pulpit. I don't remember anything he said except this right at the end. He said, by the way, if you're looking for a job, even if you're not looking for a job, we have house parent positions available at Black Forest Academy. Bing! Hey, how, that's housing. I can do that. That's what I've been doing. I can do that. Now, folks, I can tell you, going overseas was not on my radar for a new job. I'm thinking, where am I going to work here in Evansville? I got a new house. That was nowhere, anywhere on my radar. But I turned because it just hit me so strongly. I turned to say something to my wife, and she had already hit me on the leg. And we just turned and stared at each other. Didn't say anything. When we got in the car, we talked about it all the way home and said, is this crazy or what? What was that all about? So we vowed, okay, we're going to pray because obviously something's happening here. We're going to pray about it, but we ain't telling nobody. They'll think we're nuts. So that afternoon, it was my, one of my nephew's birthdays. So we went to my brother's house for cake and ice cream and such. Now, what I didn't realize was that morning, my brother was at, at, at church as well. So we're there kind of mingling around, and he walks up to me. He says, hey, Greg, when are you guys moving to Germany? And I just, I don't know what the look was on my face. But inside, I was like, holy cow, what is this? So I just tried to calmly say, what are you talking about? And he said, that guy this morning, when he said house parent positions, I thought about you guys, you'd be great. I'm like, all right. All right, so I left the party. I said, I told my wife, I got to go call Dave, the guy, the missionary. I got to go call him and talk to him. So I call him on the phone and say, hey, Dave, I just want to talk to you about becoming a house parent at Black Forest Academy. He gave me every reason why it was not a good idea. And he said, I'm going to tell you, it's a 28-hour-a-day job. It's a thankless job. Are you sure you want to do this? And I said, absolutely not. I said, but what I am sure of is I need to talk to you because God is doing something here. So two weeks later, I think it was, two weeks later, we had a meeting with he and his wife, and we shared this story with them. And Nikki, his wife, after we shared it, she said, that's it, Dave. And he said, what's it? She said, don't you remember? When you came down out of the pulpit, I said to you, why did you say we have house parent positions available? We don't have any available. She said, and you didn't say it in the first service. And you didn't say it in the third service. You only said it in the second service where they were. And he was like, okay, we got to start moving you guys towards Germany. We got, God's doing something here, and we felt it as well. But then he said, it's, gonna, it's at least a two-year process to get you on the field. By the time you get your support and all your training and all that needs to happen, it'll be a two-year process. And I'm thinking, I don't have two years. I might not even have six months. What in the world are we going to do? I didn't say that, but I was thinking it. Well, 13 months later, guess what? Fully funded, living in Germany. All, God brought it all together. 13 months, and they said it will be at least two years. 13 months later, there we are. That was God. Now, we knew we were supposed to be there. It was a great time over there. It was a hard time over there. I'm not even going to go into all that. I don't have time for that. But when you're doing that kind of work and you know, we, we lived with teenage boys, 27 to 32 teenage boys, and that's what we were doing is taking care of them. That's tough. That's tough because we did everything for them. 
laundry, cooking, clean, all that stuff. Well, we didn't do all the cleaning, but we did the other stuff. We moved back uh, after five years, and uh, it was a good five years, but it was hard. It was hard. It was more manure. I wish I could tell you more. Oh, I do want to say this. That new house we had, God provided renters all five years. So we didn't have to worry about that at all. God took care of all those details. So we returned back, and after a, a period of time of just resting and recuperating from what we'd been through overseas, I got offered a job at a church here in Evansville uh, running a children's ministry. And it was, a big, it was a big ministry. And my wife and I had got used to that time of ministering together 20, pretty much 24-7. That's just what you did. So we did the same thing. When, when I was working, she was working there, and we, we did stuff together. After eight years, God pulled me away from that ministry. It was very, very painful. I'm not going to go into all that. It's not necessary. But it was very painful. And it was, it was a lot of manure. But that wasn't the end of it. I thought, how could it get worse than this? Same thing again. What am I going to do now? I knew I was supposed to leave, but what am I going to do now? So I ended up becoming a therapist. I got an offer for a job a few months later. And I have a master's degree in counseling. So I became a therapist, and I worked with families who were involved with the Department of Child Services where the kids had been removed from the home for whatever reason. And my job was to go in and do therapy with the kids and with the family and to find out if they could be reconciled together. Uh, so great job, hard job. But what it did was it put me on the road because I went to their homes. They didn't come to my office. I went to their homes. So I was gone anywhere from 12 to 15 hours a day, sometimes six days a week. So you go from ministering together and spending all your time with your spouse to hardly having any time that you can talk about anything. And after 18 months, it was taking its toll on me for sure, and, and I'm sure it was on her as well. I switched jobs to another therapy job, uh, in, working for the same company that she worked for, thinking, okay, this is, this is going to be better. And for a short period of time, I think it was. And then the unthinkable thing that I never thought would happen. On April 8th, 2015, she walked in and said, I'm done. I'm out of here. She left. I never saw it coming. I never saw it coming. Um, you know, we, we were empty, empty nesters. Our One boy was in college. The other one had graduated and got a job in Indianapolis. Um, I've never felt more alone. I tell you, when you, when you, re, you feel rejected by the one person that you love the very most, that was painful. And then to add to that, as time went on, my two sons decided they wanted to distance themselves from me as well. So now I got all three of them that don't want to have a relationship with me. They don't want to talk to me. Now, it's not that I didn't try. It's not that we didn't have some conversations. But every time that I had a conversation with them, it felt like I was just pushing them further away. And then as I, as I was walking through that, and I can't tell you how long it took for this to come to my mind, but God brought the story of the prodigal son to me. And it was like this. The father, the son wanted away from his father desperately, and he said, I want my inheritance. You're not dead yet, but I want my inheritance now. It was as though he was saying, you're dead to me. Give me what, I'm, what I'll deserve when you die. That's kind of how I felt. We don't want you anymore, but give me what I deserve in an inheritance. And what did the father do in that story? He didn't stop his son from leaving. He stayed there and he waited. And he watched. And he waited. And he watched. One day, his son came back. And what did he do then? He ran right to his son. He didn't say, I told you so. He, no. He hugged him. He kissed him. And he said, let's have a party. That's what he said. Folks, that's what I'm doing today. I'm waiting for that reconciliation to come. It hasn't come. I'm still in this manure field. But I believe God has a plan bigger than what I can see. I've seen him do it throughout my life, so I know he's doing something. I just don't know what it is, but that's the path that I've chosen. And I believe it is the path that God wants me to choose. That does not mean that I don't feel every day. It hurts every day. But I've seen God work, and I'll share that in just a little bit. I can remember standing in my living room. It was about five years ago this time. She had left. My, my youngest son had moved out. 
my oldest was already gone, and it was me. And I stood in my living room with my hands in the air looking up. I had tears streaming down my face. And I said, God, you're all I got left. I need you right now. I need to know how to trust you. Would you please show me how to trust you? You're it. Oh, my goodness, has he shown up? Has he shown up? Let's go to point three. The enemy is real. Now, I'm not going to give the enemy all the credit here because we we each played a part in this divorce. But what I know what happened is we gave him a gap. There was a gap there that the enemy got his foot in, and then he ran with that. So he didn't do it all. God allowed it. I know he allowed it. And I still, to this day, am thinking how and why. But I want you to know, whether you believe the enemy is real or not, I'm telling you, he's real. And he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And I don't care how strong you think you are. I don't care how strong you think your marriage is. Do not give the enemy a foothold. He will rip you apart. He's way too strong for us. See, we see that in the animal world. You have one of the predators come up, and he doesn't attack the whole herd. He'll isolate one out of the herd so he can take them one-on-one. He can win that. But he can't win it when we're together. Folks, that's why Dave keeps talking about discipleship, why Dave talks about small groups, why he talks about coming together as a body, because when we're together, we're stronger. And when we isolate ourselves, we're vulnerable. We don't want to do that. So that Bible study, I think it would be a great thing to get involved in for the fellowship. I mean, You'll get so many more benefits, but then you're going to be together. I think it's critical. But that's what the enemy wants to do. That's what he did. He destroyed my marriage. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I can get better or I can get bitter. And I, don't, I really don't want to get bitter. And, I ha- and with God's grace, I haven't. And here's what I started to do. Right after I told God that I don't have anything else, just you, I started to walk. And I'd walk anywhere from 4 to 10 miles a day. Now, remember, I, I could because I was by myself. I didn't have anybody expecting anything from me or needing anything from me. I spent hours and hours and hours and still do with reading the Bible and memorizing Scripture, writing down verses that God put on my heart. I'd carry a stack of index cards with verses on them. And I, every break at work I'd get, I'd I'd scroll through those or at a stoplight. I'd st- when I would stop, I'd read through those verses. Just I couldn't get enough, and I still can't. And that, that's been an incredible thing. I listen to Christian music all the time. Now, I listen to all kinds of music now because God is, God is revealing himself in all that stuff. Now, it's, it's just God is honoring the fact that I didn't give up on him that I, I went in and said, God, you're what I got. I'm going to seek you. And God said, you're going to seek me? Then I'm going to reward that. I'm going to reward that. Let's go back. I think it says it in... No, nope, it doesn't say that in verse. I'll get to it in a minute. Sorry about that. Getting ahead of myself a little bit. So, got all these things going on. And to this day, five years later, I still... I don't walk as much as I used to. But I'm still diving. Gives me an opportunity to be here to serve and do all kinds of things. But here's some things. Uh, the, the final point that I want to make this morning and put on the screen is God is working in the manure fields of life whether we can see what he's doing or not. Like I said, sometimes he revealed it fairly quickly on what he was doing, and sometimes he didn't. And in this situation with my family, he has not. That does not mean he's not working. It does not because he says, remember, all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He is informing me through the image of his son. Somehow he's using that, and he's going to, he says, I'm going to make it all good. Trust me. You can't see it yet, but it's there. But he has revealed to me some things that I can see, and I want to share those with you. A benefit of the walking that I did, I lost 60, plant, 60 plus pounds. And I also lost type 2 diabetes. I was a diabetic for like 12 years. Taking shots, all of it. I had depression, all kinds of things. God removed all of that. Removed it all. I wouldn't have exercised like that if I hadn't gotten a divorce. Singleness versus marriage. Remember, I told you in 87 was the same year I got married was the same year that I was introduced to Jesus as my Savior. So almost all, well, 
all of my life in relationship with Jesus was as a married person. I never had experienced Jesus as a single person. I'm not knocking marriage, and I'm not telling you that I wanted it, and I'm not telling you that I still want it. But what I am telling you is this. Being single and being able to dive into God's Word and be alone with Him the way that He has provided has taken me to a level I, I don't think I ever would have gotten to otherwise. And that's not, that's not about me. That's about what He's done. And He's worked something so incredibly good in my life, I can't get enough. I just can't get enough. So yes, I'm sad about my marriage, but I'm also excited the fact that God has done this in my life because he's got something better coming for me. I know he does. Now, after the third point, after losing my home or losing my marriage and my family, I also lost my home. Then I lost my job. And it just so happened that about that time my dad's health was starting to really deteriorate. So I needed a place to be. And they could, my mom and dad could use some help, so I moved back in with my parents. Would have never done it. Never would have done it. But as it turns out, mom needed help. She needed help with dad. He, she was, he was going to the doctors all the time, and he wasn't able to get around the way he used to. So I got there. We, we had five, seven acres, I don't know, something like that there. So... I took over cutting the grass and taking care of the grounds and doing all the repairs and stuff. I built them a deck, lots of things. And I went to the grocery store for them. And I did the things for for mom so mom could concentrate on dad. So I was actually doing it for both. It has turned out to be an incredible gift for both me and my, my mom. And also, say, my dad passed away last August. But I got to spend the last three years of his life with him. Folks, that would have never happened if I hadn't gotten a divorce. Now, when I told you I lost everything, I decided at that moment, you know what, I know what it's like to have money, but I don't know what it's like to be without. So I'm going to take this time, and while I'm concentrating on God, I'm I'm not going to be distracted by a job. I'm just going to see where God has taken me. Wow, you know, it's been five years, and my job is, you can call it that, is serving. Not that I didn't try to get a job, but God closed the door very clearly on me getting a job. And what he was telling me is, I don't want you to get a job. I want you to trust me. You wanted to know how to trust me? This is a way to do that. I'm going to provide for you when you think there's no other way to provide. Just keep going. And that's what I've tried to do. And he has shown up over and over and over. And I started to go to McDonald's every day. Sounds kind of silly, but it wasn't. I felt led to do that. I would take my computer, I would take my Bible, I'd have it open, and I'd just wait for God to bring people across my path just to see, you know, who's out there. There's a lost world. There's a dying world. People need Jesus. And you know what? They need Jesus more than I need a paycheck. So th- I can't be doing anything better than this. So I'm just waiting. And there's so many people that came across my path and had so many great discussions. But there was one in particular that came across my path. And uh, one day he was sitting in a booth across from me and he came up, came over to me and he asked me what I was doing and we started up a conversation. Now, I have no idea exactly how it went that day, but we, we were talking about church and different things. And it may not have been that day, it may have been another day later because we started seeing, seeing each other regularly at McDonald's. There he is right there, his name's Mike. Now, Mike would tell you today, I think he would tell you this, he thought he was a believer, but he wasn't. Just like when I was in eighth grade, I thought I was a believer, but I wasn't. It's through our conversations about Jesus, our conversations about the Word, our diving into the Word about what does God say about this. He has all kinds of questions. What did he say about this? What about that? Today, I can tell you confidently, Mike is going to be in heaven with us forever. And I told him every bit of pain, every tear that I ever shed in my life is worth the fact that you're going to be with me in heaven forever. Still don't like the divorce, but had I not gotten a divorce, I wouldn't have met him. Now, one Sunday, kind of like this, I can't miss this. This is too good. I can't miss this part. Through that process, he admittedly didn't go to church very often. Now, when he went to church, there was one he went to, but he didn't go very often. Now get this, he invited me to go to church with him. 
Now, is that backwards? Should have been me inviting him. No, he invited me to go to church. I was like, oh, wow, okay, let's go. So I don't know how long we went there, a year, year and a half, I'm not sure, together. And he, we, we talk during the week, and we get to church, and the pastor would give a message, and he's like, that's just what we talked about this week. Does God have some sort of microphone on our discussions? And I said, that's just how God works. Now, when one day the pastor there was going to be gone, and he was going to have a substitute kind of like today here. And Mike said, hey, why don't we go check out Catalyst? I, I'm curious what that's like. And I said, yeah, it's a good time. Let's go. Well, here I am. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. He said, he brings me to church. Then he says, let's go to Catalyst. And here I am. And what, two years later, whatever, I'm giving a message. That's crazy. That's crazy. But that's God. All this stuff. God is working it together. You say, see, you could have never imagined this. But here's what I got. So now I know what's coming. Even though I can't see it, I know what's coming is going to be incredible. Because what I've experienced right now has been absolutely incredible. So I want to encourage you with that today. I do want to close with a couple of things. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. If we can see it, it's not faith. God grew my faith, and he said, trust. I asked him, God, I want to know how to trust you. And he said, okay, here you go. Faith. And he kept building my faith because I would go, how are you going to do this? What is this? And he'd go, there you go. Ah. Oh. Then he'd do it again. Then he'd do it again. Now I'm waiting, still waiting for the big one. I call the big one, not a heart attack. I'm waiting for the big one to come. And I I trust him. Somehow God's going to work all that out. Now, for you, in this crazy world, I think you can all agree we are in a crazy time. And I don't know how many of you can raise your hand and say, hey, I know what tomorrow's going to hold. I don't think so. I don't think any of us can say that. Seems like manure, right? So you take this, put it in the proper perspective. God knows everything, and God knows what he's doing. And he's got something on the other side of this junk that we're experiencing right now. Whatever it is in your personal life or in the life of this country or in the world, God's got something better because he's sovereign. And he says he'll work things together for good for those who love him. So if you love Jesus, you know something better is coming. So I want you to be encouraged with that today. When you start feeling discouraged or depressed or whatever it might be, you're anxious, remember what God said. I got this. Trust me. I got it. Now, a few verses later, this is not on the screen. It says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it's impossible. God is building your faith in the craziest of times. And I would say he's wanting to build your faith right now. Doesn't it seem crazy that we would want to resist the very the very thing that God is trying to do to create us into the image of Jesus. We say we want to be like Jesus, and he said, okay, here it comes. And you go, wait, wait, I don't want that. You just asked me for it. It seems kind of crazy. I get it. I get it. I've been there. But when you think about that, that is kind of silly. When that stuff comes into your life, remember what God is doing. He wants to conform you into the image of his son. As the band comes forward here to close, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close in a word of prayer, and then when they finish the song, we'll, we'll be dismissed. Father God, thank you for this opportunity uh, to share this morning. And Father, I, I pray that the words that uh, you put on my heart to speak would ring true in some form or fashion to each one that's listening to this. Lord, may they be encouraged by this, but may they also learn to trust you even more, especially now in these days. Lord, we always need you, but especially now. So take these words and do with them what only you can do, Father. Thank you again for today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.